A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 11th of December 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we have chosen for today's discussion. See today we have 8 articles and mostly today it's Sunday so we have chosen only science topic more. But don't worry all these topics are very much important for both your prelims as well as mains. Now without wasting much time let's get into the first news article discussion. See this article here it says that Uttarakhand is planning for the genetic enhancement of its indigenous babri cow and this is to be done to increase its productivity so the reason behind this is that the milk production capacity of babri breed is less it gives 1 to 3 liters of milk a day so to make the farmers breed babri and not to shift to high milk producing alternative breeds such as jersey it is desired to opt for multiple ovulation embryo transfer okay so this is all about this news article and in this context no let us understand about this embryo transfer technology and its benefits see before that look at the syllabus relevant to this news article please go through it now let's move on to the discussion now let's start a discussion with embryo transfer technology know that embryo transfer is a technique by which embryos are collected from a donor female and they are transferred to recipient females okay see the cow no from which we get the embryo is called as donor and the cow to which we transfer the embryo is called recipient these recipient females serve as surrogate mothers for the remainder of pregnancy okay and this embryo transfer is also called as multiple ovulation and embryo transfer technology now you may think what is the need for this procedure when animals can give birth to young ones naturally see the main reason is to increase the reproduction rate of superior female animals and this is used mainly in dairy animals normally what will happen we can get one calf from a superior female dairy animals in a year but by using this technology you no know, which is the multiple ovulation and embryo transfer technology we can get 10 to 20 calves in a year from a cow or buffalo how is this possible see a cow or buffalo will be administered with hormones which resemble fsh like activity to induce super ovulation here fsh stands for follicular stimulating hormones this one lee stimulates the ovaries to produce x and the hormones which resembles this fsh will induce super ovulation in animals this means that under the influence of the hormone the female produces several x instead of one egg and this super ovulated or multiple x female is inseminated and then no these fertilized eggs or embryos are taken from donor okay so after this the embryo will be transferred to recipient animals that is the surrogates see some good quality embryos can be frozen and preserved for transfer in future and this is how a dairy animal produces several calves in a year okay see embryo transfer techniques have been applied to nearly every species it was applied to domestic animals many species of wildlife and exotic animals then including humans and non human primates This is a rapidly developing science which has a very short lag time between discovery and the application okay now coming to the benefits of this technology see the first benefit is to get many calves from a genetically superior single female as we saw already naturally only a few calves can be produced in the lifetime of genetically superior female but using this technology we can produce more and what about the second benefit it is to help in the genetic improvement of the animal and increase the selection intensity and this leads us to the third benefit what is it to increase the productivity see if the calves are produced from the embryos of females which have high productivity then the calves will also have high productivity am i right and what is the fourth benefit it is to help the control of diseases and other factors see it is possible to obtain offspring from a genetically valuable female which has been affected by disease injury or age 
Other than this, no, it helps in avoiding the transmission of diseases. See, embryos collected from cows with bovine leukemia virus, then blue tongue virus, FMD virus, if washed properly and then transferred to unaffected recipients, it will not transmit the disease. Okay. And finally, the endangered animals can be saved from extinction by embryo production and cryopreservation. Okay. And these are some of the benefits of embryo transfer technology. If you know any other benefit other than this, comment it below in the comment section. And see, when it comes to conservation of bovine breeds, you have to remember one mission called the Rashtriya Gokul Mission. See, the Rashtriya Gokul Mission no, has been launched by the government since 2014. And it is for the conservation and development of indigenous breeds in a focused and scientific manner. The mission no, also envisages the establishment of integrated cattle development centers called Gokul Grams. This is to develop indigenous breeds including up to 40% non-descript breeds. And know that the scheme is important in enhancing milk production and productivity of bovines to meet the growing demand of the milk. Okay. And it is also important for making dairying more remunerative to the rural farmers of the country. So remember this mission whenever you come across the conservation of bovine breeds. If you mention this in your answers, no, it will really fetch you more marks. That is why I discussed regarding this Rashtriya Gokul mission along with the discussion itself. Now, with this, I have given here the objectives of this Rashtriya Gokul mission. Just take a note of it and note some important points out. Okay. So, in this discussion, we saw about what is this embryo transfer technology and what are all the benefits it is giving. And there is a mission Rashtriya Gokul mission to protect the bovine breeds. So this is what dealt in this news article discussion. See this is a very important topic regarding the means as well as this kind of mission all can be asked in your preliminary type of questions. And as you all know in prelims nowadays embryo transfer technology is a famous type of question. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. So with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. See, this news article talks about a private bill introduced in the parliament. The bill is actually a constitutional amendment bill which seeks to get guidelines for the appointment and removal of governors. So, in this news article discussion, let us understand the appointment and qualification of governor first. Okay. Firstly, as we all know, governor is a nominal executive head of the state. He forms an important part of the state executive where he acts as the chief executive head. Central government nominates the governor for each state. Okay. So what is the qualification to become a governor? See, governor has to meet only two qualifications. He or she should be an Indian citizen. Then he or she should be 35 years old or more. Except for these two conditions, we have no other criteria or no minimum qualification laid out for a governor. So, if you ask me how a governor is appointed, there is no direct or indirect election for the post of the governor. The Indian president appoints the governor for each state by warrant under his hand and seal. And as I already said, central government is responsible to nominate the governor for each state. Okay. See, the governor holds office for a term of 5 years from the date on which he or she enters upon their office. But this term of 5 years is subject to the pleasure of the president. That is, the governor has no security of tenure and no fixed term of office. The governor may be removed by the president at any time. This is called the doctrine of pleasure. See, in any contingency, the president is empowered to make such provision as he or she thinks fit for the discharge of the function of the governor. See, this is not provided in the constitution. Okay. So, this is about the qualification and appointment of the governor. Now, we shall see what is given in this news article. Okay. See, it is regarding a private bill. See, the bill identifies three broad issues with the way governors are appointed and functions under our constitution. We will see what are the three issues. First issue is that they are appointed by and be removed by only the president. 
that is by extension the party in power at the center have a chance to influence the appointment and removal okay then the second issue is the state to which they are appointed has no say at all in the governor's appointment or removal and the third one is there are no sufficient qualifications disqualifications and safeguards prescribed in the constitution for a person to be appointed the highest office in the state okay so these are the three issues that are spoken in the private bill so to address all these issues no the bill suggests some amendments to article 157 of the indian constitution see the bill says that no person shall be eligible for appointment as governor unless they are an eminent personality in some walk of life then the person shall be disqualified for appointment as governor if they have attained the age of 75 or they have been in the employment of the union or state governments or any union or state owned undertakings or you can say body or corporation or agency or any authority in the preceding 10 years okay then the bill says that the governor of a state shall be appointed by the president by warrant under his hand and seal only after obtaining the concurrence of the chief minister of the state then it also adds that governor may be removed from office before the expiry of his or her term by the president but this should be done on the recommendation of the chief minister this feature of the bill tries to address the issue with doctrine of pleasure okay see the draft of this private bill says that such pre appointment consultation will reduce friction between the governor and the cabinet especially the voids the friction that is taking place between the governor and the chief minister okay so that's all regarding this news article we saw both the static part regarding the appointment and the qualification of the governor then we saw what is given in this private bill also okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this news article this science page article is about a rarely discussed topic about men it talks about anemia in men when we say anemia our mind immediately goes to children especially girls and also women particularly pregnant women but have you ever thought about whether men have anemia actually yes they also get anemia but how why and how prevalent is anemia in men we'll see all these in this discussion after knowing the basics about anemia so before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here for your reference kindly go through it now let's start a discussion what anemia actually means anemia is a condition related to red blood cells rbcs okay see rbcs play a crucial function of delivering oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and also delivering carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs so here the oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged for this purpose rbcs use hemoglobin that is we say short as hb See this hemoglobin is a protein in our red blood cells or RBC which does the work of delivering the oxygen and carbon dioxide but this function of hemoglobin that is RBC is impaired when someone has anemia you have to know why because anemia decreases the number of RBCs so by this anemia impairs the body's ability for gas exchange that is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide so anemia can be defined as a condition where the number of rbcs and consequently their oxygen carrying capacity is insufficient to meet the body's physiological needs are you clear with this now why rbcs decrease or what causes anemia the answer to both is same there are many number of reasons for this and they can be categorized as nutritional and non nutritional causes see nutritional causes for anemia include firstly check the iron deficiency see among all the causes it is the most important reason iron is necessary for synthesis of hemoglobin so when that iron is deficient the hemoglobin does not synthesize thereby impairing its function see the prevalence of iron deficiency leading to anemia is such that it is termed the most common cause of anemia globally so it is even referred as iron deficiency anemia okay 
Then even other nutritional deficiency cause anemia. This includes deficiency in vitamins such as vitamin B9, B12 and vitamin A. See vitamin B9 is also known by the name folate. That is why it is leading to anemia. Okay. Because of these, anemia is often seen as a manifestation of undernutrition and poor dietary intake of iron. Then what are the non-nutritional ones? See, this includes defective red cell production. For example, aplastic anemia is a condition which can prevent the body from making enough red blood cells. Second is the increased red cell destruction. For example, enlarged or diseased spleen can cause increased red cell destruction. Then increased blood loss is also a reason. Then acute and chronic inflammation and parasitic infections also cause anemia. And sometimes you know inherited or acquired disorders that affect the hemoglobin synthesis, RBC production or survival can also cause anemia. This includes disorders like sickle cell disease and thalassemia. Okay, so we have seen what is anemia and what are all the causes that is nutritional and non-nutritional causes of anemia. So what will happen if someone gets anemia? For example, if a child has iron deficiency anemia, it results in impaired cognitive and motor development. And in adults, if you take the same causes decrease work capacity. Even the pregnant women are affected with this iron deficiency anemia only. It may lead to impaired sexual and reproductive development like perinatal loss, prematurity and low birth weight babies. Then prematurity means a premature birth of baby where birth takes place more than 3 weeks before the estimated due date. Generally, if you take the iron deficiency anemia, it adversely affects the body's immune response. So these are some of the effects of anemia. Are you wondering whether you have anemia? See to know that you need to know whether you have enough Hb concentration or hemoglobin concentration. It actually varies among children, men and women. Okay. And in this table here, you can find the required Hb concentration or hemoglobin concentration. So if you are a woman, ensure that you have more than or equal to 12 gram per deciliter Hb concentration. And men watching this analysis, ensure that you have more than or equal to 13 gram per deciliter Hb concentration. Then only we can say you don't have anemia. But in any scenario, if the Hb concentration drop below 7 or 8 gram per deciliter, then you will be diagnosed as severely anemic. Okay. So before continuing with the discussion, I want to tell you more about this iron deficiency. Because as I said, it is the leading cause of anemia. In this, you need to know what causes iron deficiency. First is decreased iron intake. This means your diet doesn't have enough iron content. Second is increased iron loss from the body. How we lose more iron? In case of women, no menstruation is a reason because the blood loss during menstruation causes iron deficiency. Other than this, no, helminths infestation cause blood loss. See here, helminths such as hookworm and flukes cause chronic blood loss because they feed on blood only, which leads to loss of iron. Okay. Then if you take increased iron requirement in the body, that is also a cause. For example, pregnant women and children have the highest iron requirements. Generally, men and women need around 3 to 6 mg of iron per 1000 kilocalories of dietary energy. But pregnant women need 1.9 to 2.7 mg per 1000 kilocalories. Similarly, iron requirement for children is high in the period of active growth of 6 months to 3 years. So I think so far we had covered the basics about anemia, then its causes, then what are all the impacts that it creates. Now, how prevalent is anemia? That is the question here. You can find the data in this table. Because of this, you know, anemia is considered a significant public health challenge in India. So government has taken measures to address it. Yes, you heard it right. Government is stepping towards reducing this anemia. First measure is the supplementation interventions by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. 
See, supplementation is nothing but the food supplements which are highly concentrated vitamins and minerals produced by pharmaceutical manufacturers in the form of you can say capsules, tablets or injections. For anemia, no, iron folic acid supplementation is provided through IFA tablets that is iron folic acid tablets. For this, National Iron Plus Initiative was launched. Under this, pregnant and lactating women and children in the age group of 6 to 60 months are provided with this iron folic acid supplementation. Okay. Then another measure is providing supplementary nutrition. For example, under Integrated Child Development Services Scheme, supplementary nutrition is provided to pregnant and lactating women. And this is at the rate of just rupees 5 per day per woman. This is meant to provide 600 kilocalories and 18 to 20 grams of protein. Then if you take supplementary food, this is also provided to primary school children through the national program of nutritional support to primary education. That is the midday meal program. Then adolescent girls know are covered under the scheme for adolescent girls. It focuses on out of school adolescent girls in the age group of 11 to 14 years. The scheme provides nutrition provisions and also the iron folic acid supplementation. Then other than this weekly iron and folic acid supplementation program for adolescent girls and boys is also there. It is for girls and boys in the age of 10 to 19 years and it ensures administration of iron folic acid tablet once per week and also the albendazole tablet twice a year for deworming. That is we say there are some worms in the stomach right that has to be dewormed that is what done through this tablet. Here schools and anganwadis are involved in this process and above all in the year 2018 anemia mukt bharat strategy was launched with the target to reduce anemia in women children and adolescents. It includes preventive and curative mechanisms like iron folic acid supplementation, intensified year-round behavior change, communication and testing, then treatment of anemia, etc. Now let me come to the question with which we started this discussion. Do men have anemia? The answer is yes. How prevalent is it in India? That is the next question. See, as per the data from National Family Health Survey 5, Around 25 percentage of men in the age of 15 to 49 years are anemic in India. More women are anemic, like 57 percentage in women and 52.2 percent pregnant women in the same age group are anemic. See a private study published in the Lancet Global Health found that 23.2 percentage of men in the age group of 15 to 54 years are anemic in India. This means nearly 1 in 4 men are anemic in India. Do you believe that? 1 in 4 men are anemic in India. So it is quite clear that men also prevalently have anemia. But researchers wanted to know what is the reason behind it. So they analyzed the National Family Health Survey 5 report based on which the news appeared. See this analysis now has made several findings. It found that 3 out of 10 men in rural areas are anemic and one of five urban men are anemic. This also showed that rural areas have more prevalence of anemia than in urban areas. Then it was also found that prevalence of anemia is higher among men who were underweight. Then it also found older men to be more vulnerable to anemia. Then lastly it also noted that the reason for anemia in rural men may not be iron deficiency. This is based on one of the views that men don't menstruate. So the conclusion is before framing a strategy to tackle anemia in men, the causes for it should be properly studied. See in women they study the causes and that is why they are providing for nutritional benefits and other iron folic acid supplementation right. Likewise, the cause for anemia in men has to be found out and then it has to be addressed as well. Okay, we address anemia in women, children, but anemia in men should also be addressed. So that is the conclusion we are arriving through this discussion. See, we made an elaborate discussion about anemia, its causes and what are all the impacts that it is creating. Then we saw what are all the schemes that India is providing to reduce this anemia in women, children. But what happens to anemia in men? Is it addressed? 
so this question is what discuss clearly and this is going to be a very important topic for both your prelims as well as mains because anemia and all can be asked as a preliminary type of question but when you take the schemes or the steps taken to reduce anemia it can be put as a mains question so with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now have a look at this article it is about the drug called as lecan map it was jointly developed by pharma companies biogen and esi lecan map belongs to a class of drugs called monoclonal antibodies these antibody mediated drugs target beta amyloid the protein deposition that is seen in patients with alzheimer's disease okay and this only disrupts the cell function and it was observed that lecan map robustly removed the amyloid plaques and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us understand about the alzheimer's disease in preliminary perspective first of all know that alzheimer's disease is a progressive neurologic disorder that causes the brain to shrink and brain cells to die see this alzheimer's no is a progressive form of dementia see alzheimer's and dementia they are not the same thing Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia. Dementia is nothing but a broader term for conditions that negatively affect memory, thinking and behavior, okay? Now coming back to Alzheimer's. See, as we already saw, Alzheimer's is a progressive disease which begins with mild memory loss. And eventually, you know, it will lead to loss of the ability to carry on a conversation and respond to the environment. see this alzheimer's disease involves parts of the brain no that control thought memory and language so this disease can seriously affect a person's ability to carry out daily activities itself now that we have seen about the disease let us move on to see who gets the disease see anyone can get alzheimer's disease but certain people are at higher risk of getting the disease this includes people over the age of 65 and those with the family history of the condition and know that alzheimer's is not a normal part of aging the risk factor increases with increasing aging also know that if the alzheimer's disease affects a person at the age of 65 years then it is considered to be younger onset alzheimer's younger onset no can also be referred to as early onset alzheimer's with this information let us see the symptoms of alzheimer's see people with alzheimer's disease display certain behaviors and symptoms that worsen over time they include memory loss which affects daily activities then they will have trouble with familiar tasks even like using microwave that also they may forget then they may have difficulties with problem solving then they will have a trouble with speech or writing then becoming disoriented about time or places then decreased judgment decreased personal hygiene mood and personality changes will be there then withdrawal from friends family and community So these are some of the symptoms that keeps on growing. See finally you no know, let us see about the treatment that is available. Know that there's no cure for Alzheimer's, but there are some medications and treatments that can slow the progression of the disease. One such medication is aduhelm or you can say aducanumab. It is recommended for those with early Alzheimer's and see this medication is found to reduce the protein plaques that built up in the brain. so that's all regarding this news article so briefly we saw about alzheimer's and who all can get alzheimer's and what are all the symptoms and finally we saw that there is no cure for alzheimer's directly but the progression of the disease can be slowed down with the medication aducanumab okay so that's all regarding this news article with these key points in mind let's move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at the science page article it talks about the eradication of tuberculosis through nikshe poshan yojana as per the article poor nutritional status makes an individual vulnerable to get infected by tuberculosis here if an individual gets infected by tb or tuberculosis it leads to depletion of nutrient reserves in the body and the aggravation of undernutrition Further no the article discusses about Nikshe Poshan Yojana and its community support character to aid individuals who are suffering from TB or tuberculosis so this is all about the news article given here in this context let us learn about the national tb elimination program and also about the Nikshe Poshan Yojana okay 
See, before starting our discussion, let us briefly understand what is this tuberculosis or TB. See, it is caused by bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis and it most often affects the lungs. It spreads from person to person through air and when people with TB cough, sneeze or spit, they propel the TB germs or the tuberculosis germs into the air. If a normal person inhales that air with TB germs, then the person will be infected. So from this, we can say that TB is a form of communicable disease. Okay. So this is all about the background information of TB that you have to know. Now let's see about the National TB Elimination Program. See the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program is a public health initiative by the Government of India. And this organizes anti-tuberculosis efforts. See the program was launched with an objective to bring down the TB burden in India by 2025. See, this is actually five years ahead of the Sustainable Development Goals, okay? And it functions as a flagship component of the National Health Mission and provides technical and managerial leadership to anti-tuberculosis activities in the country, okay? And if you take the program, it has a vision of achieving a TB-free India with strategies under the broad themes, that is, prevent, detect, treat, and build pillars for universal coverage and social protection. So the program provides various free of cost quality tuberculosis diagnosis and treatment services across the country. This is all done through the government health system. So now coming to the administrative mechanism of this program, at the national level, no, the program is led by the Central TB Division under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Then if you take the state TB cell and the district TB office, they govern the activities of the program at the state and the district level respectively. Okay. So this is all you have to know about the national TB or tuberculosis elimination program. Now we will see about the Nikshay Mitra Portion and Yojana. That is mentioned in the news article. See, Nikshe meaning end TB. It is a web enabled patient management system for tuberculosis control. And it comes under the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program that we saw just now. Okay. See, it is developed and maintained by the Central TB Division that comes under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. And it is in collaboration with the National Informatics Center and the World Health Organization Country Office for India. Okay, see this Nikshay Mitra portal, no? it refers to an online platform for donors to provide various forms of support to those undergoing TB treatment. The three pronged support includes nutritional, diagnostic, then occasional support. The donors called Nikshay Mitras could be a wide range of stakeholders from elected representatives, political parties, or they can be corporates or NGOs and individuals. Anyone suffering from TB in India can register their details in the said portal and ask for help. See, the tuberculosis officer of each district will do the monitoring and reply those by email. And this Nikshamitra initiative has already shown good uptake. Within three months of its launch, more than 52,000 Nikshamitras have registered to help those who are suffering from TB or tuberculosis. So, this is all about the Nikshamitra port. Through this discussion, we learned what is meant by TB in brief and then we came to the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program and with that, we saw the recent update which is the Nikshay Mitra Initiative that is coming under this National Tuberculosis Elimination Program. See, we are moving under a goal of eliminating this TB by 2025 which is much earlier to the Sustainable Development Goal. That is why these topics are very hot topics and you can expect some type of means question or preliminary question in these topics. Okay, so with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article. The news article mentions that Enforcement Directorate or ED has extended the custody of an accused person in a money laundering case. See, to understand on what basis this Enforcement Directorate gets custody, we need to understand the basics about the Enforcement Directorate. So now let's start with that. The Directorate of Enforcement or you can say the Enforcement Directorate is a specialized financial investigation agency. And it comes under the Department of Revenue in Ministry of Finance. Okay. See, this ED or the Enforcement Directorate functions as a multidisciplinary organization. 
which is mandated with investigation of economic crimes, especially the offense of money laundering. Then it also deals with violations of foreign exchange laws. Thus, it has the mandate to enforce three acts. One is the Foreign Exchange Management Act 1999. Second is the Prevention of Money Laundering Act 2002. Then the third one is the Fugitive Economic Offenders Act 2018. See this Foreign Exchange Management Act, no FEMA, it is a civil law and it provides quasi-judicial powers to the enforcement directorates and empowers officers to conduct investigations into suspected contraventions of the foreign exchange laws and regulations. This also empowers the enforcement directorate to adjudicate the offenders and impose penalties on them. On the other hand, if you take the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, it is a criminal law. It empowers officers to conduct investigations, to trace assets that were derived out of the proceeds of crime. It also provides power to provisionally attach or confiscate those assets. Then, it also empowers to arrest and prosecute the offenders who are found to be involved in money laundering. Then take the Fugitive Economic Offenders Act 2018. It provides for measures to deter the fugitive economic offenders. See, it deals with fugitive economic offenders who are evading the process of law in India by staying outside the jurisdiction of Indian courts. So, under these acts, no, the Enforcement Directorate functions as a nodal agency for cases involving money laundering. It includes collection of intelligence, carrying out research and analysis and conducting financial investigations for cases involving money laundering. So, based on these only, the main functions of the ED are print. First is to investigate contraventions of the provisions of the Foreign Exchange Management Act. Then the contraventions of FEMA or the Foreign Exchange Management Act are dealt by the way of adjudicating designated authorities of enforcement directorates and penalties up to three times the sum involved can be imposed. Second is to investigate offences of money laundering under the provisions of Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Then it also takes action of attachment and confiscation of property if the same is determined to be proceeds of crime derived from a scheduled offence under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Know that there are 156 offences under 28 statutes which are scheduled offences under the PMLA Act or the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. See, this enforcement directorate can also prosecute the persons involved in the offence of money laundering. Okay. Next, it also has powers with respect to fugitives. It processes cases of fugitives from India under the Fugitive Economic Offenders Act. See, the enforcement directorate can attach the properties of the fugitive economic offenders who escaped from India and it can also confiscate such properties. Other than this, no, the Enforcement Directorate is also required to render cooperation to foreign countries in matters relating to money laundering and restitution of assets under the provisions of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. So that's all regarding this news article. See, through this news article, we revised about Enforcement Directorate, it functions and we saw about the three acts that comes under this Enforcement Directorate under which it is functioning, okay? So that's all regarding this news article. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. See, this news article reports about the Japanese encephalitis. It is a viral infection confirmed in boy from Uttar Pradesh. The officials suspect that the origin could be migratory birds or mosquitoes. So in this sad note, let us understand about Japanese encephalitis. Okay. See, this Japanese encephalitis virus is the primary cause for this viral encephalitis in a large number of countries in the Asian continent. See, encephalitis is a condition in which the brain no, becomes swollen and this is caused by an infection or allergic reaction. This Japanese encephalitis virus is a flavi virus spread by mosquitoes and is related to same genus as yellow fever, dengue and West Nile viruses. Then talking about its transmission, the disease is transmitted to humans through bites from infected mosquitoes of the Culex species. See these mosquitoes you know, breed mainly in rice fields and large water bodies rich in aquatic vegetation. 
And apart from this, migratory birds along with pigs in the community also play an important role in the transmission of this Japanese encephalitis virus. Yes, it is enabling them to transfer from one area to another area. Then talking about its symptoms, see most people know infected with this Japanese encephalitis do not have symptoms or have only mild symptoms. However, a small percentage of infected people develop inflammation of the brain. This is what we term as encephalitis and have symptoms including sudden onset of headache, high fever, disorientation and even coma. So talking about the treatment, see vaccines are available to prevent the disease but there is no antiviral treatment for patient with Japanese encephalitis. So treatment available is supportive to relieve symptoms and stabilize the patient. Okay, that's all. Then there are four main types of Japanese encephalitis vaccines currently in use for the prevention of this Japanese encephalitis virus. What are they? They are inactivated mouse brain derived vaccines, inactivated viral cell derived vaccines, then live attenuated vaccine and live recombinant vaccines. Okay, so now talking about the prevention because always prevention is better than cure, right? See, immunization is the best prevention. All regions where the disease is recognized, public health priority should be immunized. Along with strong reporting mechanisms, surveillance should also be strengthened in the region. Since there is a little evidence to support a reduction in this Japanese encephalitis disease, burden from interventions other than the vaccination of humans. See, vaccination of humans should be prioritized over vaccination of pigs and mosquito control measures. Okay. In India, no, mass vaccination with Japanese encephalitis vaccine was started in a phased manner subsequent to the major outbreak in 2005. This Japanese encephalitis vaccination is also included under the Universal Immunization Program of the Government of India. See, these are some of the important facts that you have to have in mind for your examination perspective. Okay, so you know it is a viral disease and you know what are all its symptoms, then what can be done to treat it and what can be done to prevent it. Then we saw what is the vaccination available and the vaccination is included in the universal immunization program of the government of India. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. See recently the logo for India's upcoming G20 presidency was officially unveiled at the Hornbill Festival in Nagaland. This popular festival note showcases the art, culture and cuisine of Nagaland. It also brings attention to a family of some of the largest, most magnificent birds in our country, which is nothing but the hornbill. So in our discussion, let us have an idea about this hornbills. See, the hornbills are a family of birds found in tropical and subtropical Africa and Asia. India is a home to nine species of hornbills. These nine species include the great hornbill, Rufus necked hornbill, then wreathed hornbill, Narcantum hornbill, then Malabar pied hornbill, Oriental pied hornbill, White throated brown hornbill, Malabar grey hornbill, and the Indian grey hornbill. So these are the nine species of hornbills that are in India. The great hornbill is the largest species in the country and it is the state bird of Arunachal Pradesh and Kerala. The northeastern region no, has the highest diversity of hornbill species within India and five species are found in the northeastern states of which the red hornbill, rufous necked hornbill and the white throated brown hornbill are restricted to this region within India. See although they have a wider distribution in Southeast Asia, they are restricted to the northeastern states. Okay. See, the Narcondum hornbill is found only on Narcondum Island in the Bay of Bengal. Then the Indian grey hornbill occurs in the Indian subcontinent while the Malabar pied hornbill is found only in India and Sri Lanka. And the Malabar grey hornbill is endemic to the Western Ghats. Now we shall see few facts about the great hornbill which might be asked in your preliminary examination. As I already said, the great hornbill is the largest hornbill species found in the Indian subcontinent. 
The bright yellow horn on its top called cascue is a unique morphological feature of great hornbill. Beak is curved downwards and besides eating, it also helps while climbing the tree. See the beak and feathers on the neck, breast, wings and tail that appear yellow are actually white in color and are strained by yellowish green gland oils. Okay, they have a wingspan of 5 feet and habitat if you ask me, mature broad-leaved forest with the fruiting tree is the major habitat of the great hornbill. It mainly favors unlogged old growth forest with large trees. See, it occurs from elevation of 100 to 500 meter above main sea level. Then, when you ask me about the feeding behavior, they feed on huge variety of fruits, berries and figs. It flies great distances and disperses the seeds through pellets which help to regenerate forest. It maintains a healthy ecosystem by consuming large number of pest insects and small animals like lizards, rats and shrews. Thus, we can say it is also called the farmer of the forest. Okay, Their lifespan ranges from 35 to 40 years. Lastly and most importantly, know their conservation status. Currently, 26 out of the 62 species, that is 40 percentage of the hornbills are globally threatened or near threatened with extinction. All other species are listed as least concern according to the IUCN Red List of threatened species. The great hornbill is evaluated as vulnerable. It is protected at the highest level under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Okay, so that's all regarding this news article. In short, we had known about hornbills in this news article discussion. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion. See today we have 6 questions in which 4 will be discussing and 2 will be a quiz question for you. Okay, now let's start with the first question. It is regarding the tuberculosis topic. Here two statements are given. So we have to go through both the statements before arriving at the answer. Now take the first statement. It says India has the highest tuberculosis affected population in the world. Yes, this statement is correct. According to the statistics, India has the highest tuberculosis affected population. Then now take the second statement. India has launched the Nikshe Portion Yojana, a direct benefit transfer scheme for helping TB patients. See, this statement is also correct. We saw about this in our discussion itself, right? See, the scheme provides rupees 500 per month as a nutritional support to each notified TB patient. And this is for the duration for which the patient is on anti-TB treatment. Incentives are delivered through direct benefit transfer scheme to bank accounts of the beneficiaries. Okay, so this statement is also correct. Since the question is demanding for correct statements, your answer here will be option C, both 1 and 2. Now look at the second question. So here in options, multiple statements are given and you are asked to find the correct statement. Here the answer is option B, that is the governor can dissolve the legislative assembly of a state. This is because he is the head of the state and he or she is appointed by the central government to ensure that the state government works within the rules and regulations of the constitution. So whenever the state government is not working under the rules and regulation of the constitution, the governor can dissolve the legislative assembly of a state. When you take article 174 clause 2 sub clause b of the constitution, it gives power to the governor to dissolve the assembly on the aid and advice of the cabinet. Okay. Now take this third question. See it is regarding the Japanese encephalitis. Here three statements are given and we are asked to find the correct statement. Okay. Now let us start with third statement. See there is an effective antiviral treatment for patients with Japanese encephalitis. See we saw that there is no antiviral treatment for the patients those who are affected with this Japanese encephalitis right. So this statement is incorrect. When you know that statement 3 is incorrect you can eliminate two options which is option B and C. Now just you have to find whether statement 2 is correct or incorrect. Most people infected with Japanese encephalitis have severe symptoms. See this statement is incorrect because most don't show any symptoms or only mild symptoms will be seen. So that is incorrect. So what is the answer for this question? Yes, it is option A, one only. So look at the first statement. It is a flavi virus. Yes, it is related to dengue, yellow fever and West Nile viruses. Yes, the statement we already discussed in the discussion itself. Okay, now moving on to the last question. 
it is regarding the great indian hornbill here the question is asking where all it is most likely to come across here four options are given and the answer for this question is option d western ghats see the great hornbills are found in three separate areas in south asia they are the western ghats the himalayan foothills in uttaranchal to south nepal then in bhutan and northeast india okay and that's all for prelims practice discussion see today we have two quiz questions go through the question and try to answer these question comment your answers in the comment section and the right answer will also be posted in the comment section itself and now displayed here are two mains practice questions for you go through the questions try writing answer for these questions it will be really helpful to fetch more marks in the mains examination and that's all for today's discussion if you like this video do like share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the shankar rice academy's youtube channel thank you for listening